Good morning. I always like to start off with a scripture, and I just happen to have one hanging on the wall here. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Anybody know where that's from? In the Bible, that's, that's right. <laughs> you, know, you know what I like about the Word of God? You can take a scripture like this that was written 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago and has nothing to do with you, but you get in a situation and that scripture comes alive and it will, it will guide you and it will direct you. That scripture takes place in uh, Zechariah uh, 4, 6. And if you, if you read down a, just a little bit further, see, it was when, it was when the uh, children of Israel were coming back from captivity in Babylon. And everybody was resisting them. They were trying to build a temple. And isn't it amazing when you try to do something for God, how much resistance you get? But, but the people in the area were resisting them. And the Lord spoke that through the prophet and, and told him, tell this to the people. And because of the resistance, you know, you, you're not going to overcome by your power, but it's by my power. And if you look down a little further, and, and I'm just, I'm just going to read this. Verse 9 and 10. And they had laid the foundation for the, for the temple, and it says, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. For who has despised the day of small things? Now, all of this doesn't really have anything to do with my text, but it, it's, I want to share that because just to share how the text came about. My translation of the Bible, the King Frank Version. <laughs> and you know, you could get in trouble reading the King Frank Version. You better stick to one of these, one of these good versions that, uh, that will lead you, lead you right. But what I mean by that is sometimes I remember scriptures a certain way or I interpret them a certain way. But just like this, this scripture where it says, For who has despised the day of small, small things? And in my mind, I remembered that as despise not small beginnings. Well, basically, that's what it's saying. But if you go try to look that up in the concordance, it's, it's hard to find that way. But uh, that's how this message came about. Two weeks ago today, we were in the Sunday school room there, and we were discussing some things. And I had a thought, and that doesn't happen often, but once in a while it does. So when I have one of those, I try to write it down because, you know, I want to remember it for later. Well, I wanted to be as discreet as I could. You know, we're in, in Sunday school. I don't want to rustle a bunch of papers. So I, I looked in my Bible, and I had this 3-inch by 3-inch Post-it note that was already filled up on the front. I had this little drawing of something I was working on for the PA system upstairs. But the back was blank, so I wrote that thought down. See, I learned that years ago in uh, 1972 when I got saved. The only poems I'd ever written was for school. And, of course, I'd turn that in and, oh, this is not, this is not, this is not. I said, I'll never write another poem again, you know. So, But in 1972... That first night when I was saved, a poem started coming in my mind. And I says, well, I'll write that down tomorrow. I'll, I'll get up and I'll, I'll write that down tomorrow. This little boy said, no, you won't remember. Uh, yeah, I'll remember, I'll remember. So I finally got up and, and wrote it down. And the more I wrote, the more came to me. Well, now I'd, <laughs> I wrote this down. I wasn't intending to write a message, to bring the word. 
But, you know, it was just a, just a little note. And so, as the day went on, I was up there operating the PA system, and another thought came. Two in one day. <laughs> who, who could believe it, you know? So, you know, I'm up there, and I can get out a, a full sheet of paper then without, you know, distraction. So I take out this sheet of paper, and I continue on, and these two thoughts lined up with each other. That's, that's pretty good for me. So I wrote it down, and Pastor Bob preached, preached the word, and it seemed like what I had written down kind of went with that. But, I, you know, I couldn't swing from the chandelier and come down here and say, Pastor Bob, let me share this. So when the, when the service was over, I came up, and I had gone from this to a half a sheet of paper. And I, and I shared it with Pastor Bob. I said, look, uh, this thought just kept coming to me, you know, and, and, and I wrote it down. And uh, he said, well, why don't you share that next week? I said, okay, uh, you know, five minutes, I'll be done. So, don't laugh, Rosemary. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I went home and I, I, you know, I started following up on this. And I started writing. And I started writing. The paper industry loves me. But uh, anyway, well, I love it because I work at a paper mill. So The next week was the 10th anniversary of September the 11th, 2001. So, you know, it had been a lot of, a lot of stuff going on about, about remembering 10 years ago. And... So when I came in, I told Pastor Bob, I said, I, I have something to share. He said, oh, is it that thing that you shared with me last week? I said, no, that thing is, that thing's blown up. It's just, I think it's going to be a message, you know. So uh, he said, okay. So Rachel came up and sang. Charles got up and shared, and I had something to share, and Pastor Bob shared. And it was like, it was like a basket. It was like a basket. It was all woven in to one message. And that was just, it wasn't planned. Nobody planned it. But it was woven together just like this. Different strands, different individual strands, but it all made one basket. And the Lord has a way of, of doing that. We've seen that happen over and over and over in our services. I started out with this, and I was obedient to write it down, and I ended up with this, a 27-page booklet. And I said, you know, <laughs> anyway, I, I talked to Pastor Bob, and, and he says, well, you know, that last week I talked to Pastor Bob, and he says, well, do you have that thing ready to bring? I said, uh, yeah, I, I've got it ready to bring. He says, well, how about bring it next week? So here I am. But, and it's, it's really, the name of this booklet and the name of this message is First or Last, and it has to do with marriage, and it seems that Pastor Bob is bringing a lot of word on marriage. Charles brought a word on marriage Wednesday night, and yeah, I know it's, it's some single people that, well, we're not married, and you know, but that seems to be the way the Lord is directing. I mean, I started out with this. I wasn't planning to bring a word. It, to me, it didn't have anything to do with marriage. Well, yeah, a little bit, but you know, I just, I wrote it down. So, I started out with that small thing. I didn't, I didn't despise that small thing. Now, that's a word for somebody. Whether it's a person in here, or a person listening on the CD, or watching on the DVD, or however it is, it's a word that was written thousands of years ago, but it's getting down into your spirit right now. You're, you've, you've begun to despise 
the small place you're in. You know, God can put you in a small place for your benefit. Linda ordered me some rose bushes from Texas. Now it was easier for them to put it in a box and mail it to, to me than it was for me to go all the way out to Texas, pick those bushes up, and come back. Not that I would have objected to that, but, you know, it's just, it's only 24 hours in a day. So, they put those roses in this box, and they sealed it up, and they mail those things through UPS. And you know how careful UPS is to bring your stuff, and uh, uh, there it is on the door. No, I'm not, I'm not picking on UPS. I'm just talking about, you know, w look at the box, you know. But they, they, put in, they put things in there to make sure it was protected. And look, they put instructions in there of what I was to do when I got the box, when I opened the box. It says... Open box immediately and read instructions. The only thing is, it's on the inside. How do I know to open the box immediately? But anyway. Uh, yeah, where'd we get him? You'll only know what that means if you got the DVD. So, these, these people wanted me to get these roses. They wanted them to be alive. They wanted me to be able to plant them and let them grow. They wanted them to get here safely. So they packed them in there with care, put protection around them, and they mailed them off. You know, sometimes God has to put us in a box, a small place. We try to put God in a box. All right, God, get in this box. And when I need you, I'll call on you. You know the mystery of that? God refuses to get in a box, but he'll live in a smaller place. He'll live in your heart. He won't live in a box. He might box you, but no. <laughs> anyway. But inside of this box are my prized possessions. And it says, upon arrival, unpack the roses, remove, remove the plastic bag, and replace any soil that has been lost during shipment. Have we lost any soil when we got shipped around? It says, water thoroughly. The water of the word. I'm not even getting to the message yet. As a, as a result of shipping stress, there may be some yellowing of leaves or leaves lost. This is not serious. I'm, I'm reading here now. I'm not making this stuff up, although I can. The roses will soon flush, flush out with new leaves. Cut back any canes that have been damaged. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. You know, if you've got something going on that's, that's making your leaves fall off, get rid of it. Cut back any canes that have been damaged in shipping and handling. Place the containers in a semi-shaded area and allow a few days for a an adjustment period before transplanting. But wasn't that nice of them to send us instructions? You know, God does the same thing. Sometimes he ships us around. He moves us around. He has to put us in a... It was dark in that box. Sometimes we get in a dark place, a small place. Sometimes, God, my ministry's not... It's, it's not blooming. Well, i got to put you in this dark place for a while. Okay. So, I 
me get a, a drink of water here. I've, I've been in a dark place and I, I need some of that water. You understand that, don't you, Pastor Bob? All right. Uh, what I really want to do is, is just go over the... Uh, one thing about this, this thought that I had. You know, thoughts can come from you, come to you from yourself. Thoughts can come from God. Thoughts can come from the enemy. What you do with that thought is the important thing. You can nurture that thought. You can embrace that thought. But you know, if it's, if it's a thought from the enemy, and you don't cast it down, that little thought, just like this little piece of paper turned into this book that was 26 or 27 pages long, that little thought from the enemy can end up in murder. You have to cast it down. What I'd like to do is just cover the book. All right. And originally when I, when I started this, I was going to start off with a scripture there, which I always like to start off with a scripture, but we started off with this other one. But even the booklet, I started off with a scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this, and I, I really kind of explained it earlier, but it says, some scriptures are written uh, specifically to deal with relationships between a husband and a wife, while others are written deal, to deal with relationships in general. Even the ones written for general relationships can apply to the husband and the wife. And I've used a couple of these scriptures more than one time and, uh, because they fit different applications. And they, when you repeat something, you can repeat it for emphasis. And all of these, all of these scriptures will be from the New American Standard Bible, unless otherwise uh, indicated. And so the first scripture we use is from the King James. But uh, all right, let, let me also add this down at the bottom. The next scripture is from the King James Bible. I've pulled it out of context to get your attention. Please stay with me to the end of the booklet, or you may miss the point. First Timothy one thirteen out of the King James. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. In marriage, God expects a man to be first and a woman to be last. Hold your stones. Don't throw them at me yet. All right, let's look at the acronym for the word first. Faithful, impartial, respectful, spiritual, trustworthy. Girls, how many of you want a man like that? All right. The man should be first. First to say, I love you. First to apologize in an argument. Who wrote this? Uh, for, Linda, did you change? No. <laughs> first to forgive his mate. First to compliment his mate. First to defend his mate and first to lay down his life for his mate. The woman should be last. The acronym for last is loved, accepted, sanctified, tender-hearted. The woman should be last. Last to point her finger at her mate. Last to criticize her mate. Last to control her mate. Last to complain about her mate. Last to hold a grudge, last to be bitter. Remember, Jesus said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Right, notice that each partner has much responsibility, but we all have accountability. 1 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the woman 
and, and the man is the head of a, of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. I saw something when I wrote this that, that I hadn't seen before. I want you to understand that Christ is the head. The head. You only have one head. The is one. The head. Christ is the head of every man. Christ is the head of every man. Lost, saved, regardless. Christ is the head. If you don't accept him, that doesn't, that doesn't terminate his headship. Christ is the head of everything. Every man. The man is the head of a woman. I'm the head of my wife. I'm not the head of Willie's wife. I'm not the head of Pastor Bob's wife. I'm the head of a woman. And now some other translations put in the woman, but the is still singular. One woman. But we'll see some of that later on in some other scriptures where it says that the husband should love his wife. The wife should be submissive to her husband. Amazing. All right, in the context of marriage, let's look at the following scriptures. And this applies to, to all of us. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for, the own pers for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Well, you know, how can we do this? Can we do this under our own power? Philippians 2, 13 says, For it is God that is in you to work and to will. to do his good pleasure. He's not just working on you, but he's working on your will. He's making the things you don't want to do, the things you're not willing to do. He's working on those, if you let him. He won't go against your will, but if you submit your will to him, he will work on that. And he'll make these things come about. My, my partner at work uh, made this statement one day. The tongue is wet and it will slip. I told him, oh, that'll preach. I'll use that. And he just smiled. But I added to it, well, maybe the reason that my foot is wet and it slips is because I'm always putting it in my mouth. <laughs> I think I'll get some, since the tongue's already wet, I'll put a little more wet on it. Sometimes you just have to pause and, and sila, pause and think about these things. Let's look at what the word says. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. He who restrains his lips is wise. That's Proverbs ten nineteen. Proverbs twelve eighteen. There is one who speaks rashly. Like the thrust of a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from trouble. Now these may seem familiar to you if you've been here. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. And I added, or mouth. That was Proverbs 14.1. Proverbs 13.2-3. through 3. 
From the fruit of a man's mouth he enjoys good, but the desires of the treacherous is violence. The one who guards his, his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens his mouth comes to ruin. And if you remember, I shared some time back, I made up this little card, and I took Proverbs 14.1 and Proverbs 13.2 and 3, and I consolidated them, and I, I changed it around a little bit. I modified it. And I, I came up with this, and I, I left the word woman out, and I just put a blank there with instructions to fill in your name where the blank is. Proverbs 14.1, the wise Frank builds my house, but the foolish tears it down with my own mouth. Proverbs 13.2, from the fruit of my mouth I enjoy good, but the desires of the treacherous is violence. And in verse 3, when I guard my mouth, I preserve my life. When I open wide my lips, I come to ruin. All right, let's see what James has to say about the tongue. James 3, 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. Isn't that amazing? You can defile your whole body with your tongue. Just one slip. One slip and you can, you can ruin your marriage. And it sets on fire the course of our life. And it's set on fire by hell. All right, verses 8 through 10. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been, been, made, uh, who have been made in the likeness of God. With the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be. You're driving down the highway. You got the CD on, you're praising the Lord, you got one hand up, you want to lift two, but you got to keep one on the steering wheel. And this guy cuts you off, and you went from praise the Lord to you sorry. Just in, just, just in a minute, where'd, where'd that come from? Have this attitude in yourselves, which also, which is also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God to be a thing grasped. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and, becoming found, and, and being found himself in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the cross. Now, if Jesus had that attitude... What kind of attitude should we have? And 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12 says, To sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. It's, it's, it's easy when everything's going nice, but when somebody insults you, I mean, let, let, me just, let me just get this one in, and then I'll get over here and repent. And Oh, y'all don't have that trouble. Huh? Okay. All right. But give a blessing instead, for you were called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. For let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil, but it's wet, it slips and his lips from speaking guile. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears attend to the prayers, to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
You know, even if you tried and failed and your life seems to be hopeless, remember this. First, uh, I mean, uh, Philippians 1 6. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it. And we know that word perfect means mature, so I added in continue to make it become mature in you until the day of Jesus Christ. Until you give up? No, until the day of Jesus Christ. He's not going to give up. He's not giving up. You might end up in that small place, in that box, being shipped to Texas or back from Texas. It's dark in there. People throwing me around, abusing me. But he's not going to give up. That song, He's Still Working On Me, pops in my mind, but I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> Who said thank you? <laughs> All right, that's the end of this section of the booklet. Or you could say it's the end of the beginning. The rest of the book I'm going to dedicate to... Uh, to scriptures that refer to the acronyms for first and last. But I do have to say one thing. Uh, I knew this thing was getting longer than I'd expected at first. And I said, well, you know, great day. I, you know, I can't give out a, a concordance size booklet. So I'll just put this first section in and call it like the outline for this other. And then I'll, I'll have as much room as I need in the other. But Linda said, well, that's, that's not a good idea, you know, because you've got two books floating around you. It's going to be hard to, to keep them together. I hate it when I have a good idea, and then... <laughs> but, you know, the last time I heard the audible voice of God, I turned around and looked, and Linda's lips were moving. Now, you take that, you take that for what it's worth. You like that, Justine? <laughs> you take that for what it's worth. I hate it when that happens. <clears throat> I came up with this idea. What does she know? <laughs> I did not come up with the idea. I, this small piece of paper. She could have said, that's stupid. She didn't do that. She said, well, you know, my opinion is you need to put it all in one, and they don't get lost. They're all right there together. And Okay, yeah, I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> so here we are. All right. Page 10. Some scriptures are gender-specific, while others may apply to both genders. Although it might mention one, one gender, the, the principles can apply to both genders. And we can see that in Ephesians 5.23. It says, the husband is the head of the wife. That's specific. The husband is a man. The wife is a woman. Got that? Want me to read it again? <laughs> but when it comes to... Uh, a couple of verses later, in, in 25 and 26, it, 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 Jesus said, or he's talking about, uh, Paul is writing, he says, Christ is the head of the church. The church is comprised of men and women, but it, it's referred to as her. Again, in Revelation 19, 7, 7 and 8, talks about the saints, and it's referring to both men and women, and they refer to as the bride of the lamb. Or the King James says the wife of the lamb. Right, likewise, in Romans 8.14, it says, All who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That's a masculine reference. In the, with the feminine references, the men just have to get used to, the, to being referred to a, a feminine reference. The, the, uh, the men, have, the women have to get used to the masculine reference. But of course, Paul, he, sa he settled the whole issue. In Galatians uh, 3, 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, 
There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now when it comes right down to it, whether we're a man or a woman, we all need to be first. Faithful, impartial, respectful, spiritual, trustworthy. And whether we're a man or a woman, we all want to be last. Loved, accepted, sanctified, tenderhearted. All right, let's follow up with some, some scriptures. Let's follow up with some uh, scriptures for the acronym for the man being first. All right, F, faithful. Proverbs, Proverbs 15. Proverbs 5, 15 through 18. Did I say first? I meant faithful. We're going to spell out first, but it's, the F is faithful. Proverbs, 5, Proverbs 5, 15 through 18. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the street, let them be yours alone. And not for a stranger with you, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Ah, well, that's Old Testament. Let's get some New Testament in here. Yeah, no, I got, I, I, you know, I, I got to have the New Testament. All right, well, here you go. This is Jesus talking. This is right from the throne. Matthew 5, 27 through 28. You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. And that's from the Old Testament. He was quoting the Old Testament, and he was dealing with people that, that uh, were living under the Old Testament laws. But Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone that looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery and is with her in his heart. All right, Im impartial. Proverbs eight twenty one. All right, thank you. I'm glad I gave you all a book. Otherwise, no telling what it would say on that, on that CD, you know, but uh, maybe when we pass out the books, we can, when we pass out the CDs, we can pass out the books with them so they'll be able to read it for themselves. Here, it's like the little girl that, uh, you know, she got saved and the devil came and whispered to her, you know, you're not saved, you're not saved. So she turned on the light and she got the Bible out and opened it up, slid it under the bed and said, here, devil, read it for yourself. <coughs> anyway... <coughs> Impartial. I told you it's all stuffed in there and you never know when it's coming out. Look out. Mm. Proverbs 28, 21. To show partiality is not good because for a piece of bread a man will transgress. 1 Timothy 5, 21. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing with the spirit of partiality. Acts 10, 34. And opening in his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show par partiality. And Ephesians 5 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. All right, since we see that God is not does not show partiality, then, then we should imitate him and not show partiality. Uh, especially if the marriage includes children, you shouldn't show partiality between the children because you can, you can create all kind of problems. Respectful. Ephesians 5.33 Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his wife even as himself. His own wife. Thank you. His own wife. See, I was supposed to go back and underline these, but I, you know, I was so late getting all this stuff. But in my copy, I was going to underline that so I could, but thank you. His own wife. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself. And let the wife see to it that she respect her, her husband. Now this is a key uh, scripture for, married, for a married couple. The wife needs to feel loved so in, 
the instruction to the husband is to love her. The husband needs to, be, needs to feel respected, so the instruction to the wife is to respect him. Man, God had a plan, didn't he? If the husband wants to reap respect, he must so respect and love his wife. If the wife wants to reap love, she must so love and respect her husband. You have to give away what you need in order to get what you don't have. Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. They will pour into your lap. For by the standard of measure, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. You know, this booklet, and I'm not talking about just, just the uh, marriage part of it, but that scripture right there brings repentance to my heart. You're going you're gonna to judge me? You're going to use the you're gonna use the tape that I use to measure it? So, this booklet has kind of, you know, brought me to my knees a little bit. On the negative side, if you sow disrespect, you'll reap disrespect. If you look in the dictionary, somewhere between dating and divorce, you'll find disrespect. Spiritual. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. See, when, when I read this, let me stop for a minute. When I read this, I learned it in the King James, so when I, when I go, well, even when I'm reading it here, you know, it, it, sometimes it'll, it, the words will come out in the King James. So, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the will of God that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And Ephesians 5, 17 and 18 says, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. Do not get drunk with wine or anything else, for that is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Trustworthy. Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which, which, with which you have been called. All right, the man should be first, first to say, I love you. Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself for you an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Ephesians 5, 28. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. And Matthew 5, 18 tells us, out of the abundance of the heart, I like that better in the King James, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, you know, if we're commanded to, to love our wives, then, then we ought to speak it out. In Ephesians 5.19, now this isn't specifically talking about married people, but it, it, it's in general, but I'm going to apply it to that. It tells us to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with our hearts to the Lord. All right? The husband should be first to apologize in an argument. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Proverbs 15, 1, a, gen a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 16, 24, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 18, 19, 
I was just a young boy then, 18, 19. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended a wife, a husband. You know, you can, you know. A brother offended is harder to be won back, to be won than a, than a strong city. And the contentions are like bars of a castle. What do bars do? Bars either lock somebody in or lock somebody out. And if you put up the bars, you'll be the one locked in. Or out. Death, death and life, uh, Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I'm trying to hurry to get all of these, these scriptures in. but <clears throat> Proverbs 4, 26 through 27. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the, wrath, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, on your anger. And do not give the the devil any opportunity. Ephesians 5, 21. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. And we're familiar with the story. But it says, Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, not that you have something against him, but you remember that he has something against you. You be the first to apologize. Leave your offer, leave your offering, therefore, at the altar and go your way. First be reconciled. The man want to be first, so first be reconciled with your brother, then present your, your, your offering. Adam was first, then Eve. First, first to forgive his mate. Matthew 6, 15, 6, 14 and 15. For if you, give, if you forgive men their tres, transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you your transgressions. Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord... How often shall I forgive my brother if he sins against me? And, and I forgive him up to seven times. And boy, Peter was stretching it then. He, you know, I, I'm going to go out on a limb. Seven times? And Jesus said, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. And you don't have to do the math. What Jesus is saying, an endless amount. You, you keep a little book and all right, that's, that's 415 <clears throat> Ephesians 4 32 be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you first to compliment his mate Philemon 1 6 and I want to read this out of the, the, the King James that the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you just as we want our faith to grow by acknowledging every good thing that is in us in Christ Jesus, if we want our, our wife's love for us to grow, we have to acknowledge every good thing in her that we see in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 16, 24. And we've used this before, but... Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and, a healing, and healing to the bones. Remember that 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 say that all, scriptures, all Scripture is inspired by God, profitable. One translation says it's God-breathed. God breathed that into us. And it's, it's profitable for training, reproof, correction, etc., With that in mind, let's look at the following scriptures. The Song of Solomon can be an example of how a man can talk to his wife. Put these principles in your word, own words and mean them with your heart. Men are stimulated by what they see, and women are stimulated by what they hear you say. Song of Solomon 115. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. 2.14. 
O my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep path, let me see your form. Man's always wanting to see something. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Your form is lovely. 4-7, you're altogether beautiful, my sister, my bride. There is no blemish in you. 4, 9 through 11, you have made my heart beat faster. Wait, are we in church? <laughs> you have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister. How much better is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip with honey. Honey and milk under your tongue. I call that the land of milk and honey. Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> the, the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Now, Linda and I grew up in different areas of the country. She grew up in New Jersey. I grew up right here in South Carolina. And so, you know, when we first got married, We'd sit down to eat the evening meal, and I sat down to eat dinner. I mean, I sat down to eat supper. She sat down to eat dinner. Well, you know, we could have had a big to-do over that, but because, you know, uh, Solomon said it's the small foxes that ruin the grapes, that ruin the vines, you know. But, you know, to this day, I sit down and I eat supper. She sits down at the same meal and eats dinner. Right? No problem. But, and there was this, thing that I, that I came up with in my mind, I don't know where it came from, nobody told me this, but when I was growing up, you sit down to eat a meal, it had to be three things on the plate. I mean, you know, you just had, so Linda grew up in the north, you know, and just whatever, you know, she'd sit down and she'd have a casserole and it had everything in it. But it, that's, that's it. It was a casserole. I said, where's the rest of it? She said, it's all right there. I said, wait a minute now. You've got to have three things. She says, where is it written? You gotta, I said, well, that, I'm telling you. In the south here, we have to have three things. So, and, and, you know, meat and potato, you've got to have something else with it, you know. But anyway, so I said, she said, well, everything's in there. I said, that's one thing. She said, no, that's all of it. And so, we had succotash. I said, well, is that, what, is, is that uh, you know, the peas and the carrots and everything that's in it? Is that five things? No, that's just one thing. That's succotash. I said, oh, well, oh, how is that one thing, you know? <laughs> you, you can't win. You know, you know I can't win. But uh. Anyway, we had, we had a, a meal the other day, and she, she fixed some... Uh, Chicken and rice and peas, and you know it—it it was good. That's three things. Uh, yeah, it was three things. So, so you know, I ate it, and and so the next day, the next day, I sent her an email, and I'm gonna get in trouble for sharing it, but I was gonna copy it and bring it, but I didn't, so I just have to give you the rough draft. I said. My dearest darling wife, last night you prepared a meal for supper, and I put in parentheses dinner so she'd know what I was talking about. No, <laughs> she, she knew, she knew. And I titled, I titled this little note, you know, three things. And I says, and you prepared a meal that consisted of rice and chicken and peas. And I said, you know, you were kind enough to add beets and strawberries so that I would have three things according to my standard. Now see, she was, wasn't she nice? And so, and so, and, and I added, I said, and I am truly blessed by God to have a wife that is as considerate as you are. And 
And you are, you are, and I had to put in parentheses right now because she'll, she'll add something to it if I don't. I, I put in you are, and you are right now as delicious as that meal was. Now see, that's a small thing. And she wrote me back an email. And she said, well, uh, forget that. <laughs> none yo, none your business. <laughs> it's the small things. See, we're supposed to be the first to compliment. How many wives would like to get just a little email? I said, thank you for that mail. I actually wrote in there M-A-L, Mal, but she knew I meant meal. So anyway, I didn't proofread it before I sent it. You imagine sin, it's gone. But uh, anyway, just a, a little thing like that. And normally Linda is down here. And well, she's up there filling in for me on the PA system. So I'm not going to ask her to come all the way down those stairs. But... Some guys don't like this now, so find something else. If you don't like what I'm going to do now, find something else, a, another way to express, I enjoy doing this. Where'd it go? <laughs> I moved it here so I'd remember where it was. You see why I write the notes? <laughs> I went and I got this for Linda. I enjoy doing this. I, it, it, it does something for me. First date we ever went on. I showed up, and I was going to wear it today, but I, I didn't. I, I had a red shirt and white pants and a red rose, but I didn't, I didn't wear it. So anyway, I know this is running, running long, but if you have to go, uh, go ahead, knock yourself out. It'll save me the trouble. <laughs> It's in there. You squeeze, it's going to come out. <laughs> razor blades. Yes, thank you. She asked if I had a good breakfast. Yes, razor blades. <laughs> All right, let's, let's move on. First, to defend his mate. Ephesians 5.31 says, For this cause a man will leave his father and mother. That, that has always amazed me when... You know, that came from Genesis when, uh, when God told Adam, you know, here's Eve, you know, and, and you shall leave your father and mother and cleave to your wife. Did Adam say, what's a mother? Adam didn't have a mother. Did you ever think about that? But God, God told that to Adam. But anyway, that, that's just stuff that, that's stuff stored up in there. Uh, but this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And you know, have you noticed, especially with older couples, how they start to, uh, after time, look like each other? They start to talk like each other. They start to act like each other. They like, they, they start.